if you were going to be baptized as an adult, as a free thinker, deciding for yourself what you want to believe, you were at odds with the state. The state could not afford it because there would be insurrection. Heavenly Father, whenever it comes to these issues that we are talking about in this ministry, there will be opposition, and we can expect it. But we know that you are mightier than all opposition and that your angels are there at our beck and call if we are faithful. And you have promised to protect us, and we thank you for that. Please bless us this evening as well, and may... Angels of strength surround this place. And may this message also reach people out there that don't understand these issues. And I thank you that we can be part of this issue in this, these last days. And uh, bless the audience. Bless those that are watching on live stream. And thank you that we can be a part of this final thrust to humanity. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, let's start. I was talking to a young man the other day, a third generation Adventist, and I asked him, if people came to you saying, you're supposed to know, I, I need help. The Bible speaks about Babylon, and that those that are in Babylon will... Receive the plagues. Can you help me? Who's Babylon? Could he tell me? Could he explain it to me? No. He didn't have the foggiest idea who Babylon was. And yet it is a life and death issue. Because God says that when Babylon falls, that it will receive the plagues. Therefore come out of her, my people. It's absolutely essential that the world knows who Babylon is. And how do you bring a message to people that says, Come out of her, my people. What must I come out of? Surely you must explain what you must come out of. So Babylon has fallen. Daniel 5 verse 25, and this is the writing that was written, Many, many tekel ufarsan. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many. God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and not found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, you know, you can just read over that text and think nothing of it. But there's a lot of detail in that text that people might miss. For example, it says, Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsan. Why? Mene twice. Because many means God has numbered thy kingdom and has finished it. Well, the reason why it's there twice is because the ruling monarch that this was displayed to was Belsasa. But he was not the supreme ruler. There was one who was higher than him, and that was his father. And his father had withdrawn to monastic life. In other words, the true leader was in the religious sphere. So there was a political ruler and there was a spiritual ruler. And the union of church and state or religion and state were condemned together. Many, many, you've both been numbered and found wanting. So this is fascinating if you go into these little things to see how, how accurate the Bible is. 
Revelation 18 has this final warning to humanity. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For how many of the nations? All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. So who's involved? The entire religious sphere, the entire political sphere, and the entire economical sphere. They're all involved. And it's interesting that the merchants are running their businesses at the beck and call of whom? Of Babylon. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now Babylon is called by the name her. So it's female. And a woman in the Bible is a what? Church. It's a church. It's a religious system. Come out of her. That you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Now, Sins. What are sins? We need to know what are sins. Well, whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3 verse 4. So this Babylonian system, this Babylon, is a transgressor of God's law. James 2 verse 9. If you have respect to persons... You commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. Now, why would the Bible have that verse in it? Because Babylon is obviously, if it is a religious system, run by people. And those people are preaching to people. And the Bible says, if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. Who should you have respect to? God. But people today don't want to know what God says. They want to know what does my pastor say? What does my minister say? What does my priest say? What does my imam say? What does my, what did my rabbi say? They want to know what does the person say? It's not an excuse. You must know what the Bible says. So Babylon is a transgressor of the law. And therefore it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her transgression of the law. That you be not a listener and a committer to persons rather than the word of God. And that you receive not of her plagues for her transgression of the law and her People involved in peddling this information have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. That's what it says. So we do not have to guess as to what comprises Babylon. So let's make sure. What is Babylon? Well, Revelation 16 verse 9 calls it also the great city. And it tells us that it consisted of three parts. So it was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So she has three components. We need to identify them. Revelation 16 verse 13 tells us what the spirits are like within the system. And they are like the spirits of three unclean Spirits like frogs. And they come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So there are three components. The one is called the dragon component. The other one is called the beast component. And the other one is called the false prophet. So we need to identify them. We need to know who they are. And the Bible tells us who they are. We don't have to guess. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out of that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. 
He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So who's the dragon? The devil. Now Babylon, being a, a system of religion, obviously is the representative of the devil. How do you represent someone? Well, let's, let's turn around. If I want to be a minister of the gospel, who am I representing? How do I represent him? By teaching what he says, right? That's what you do. So if people or organizations preach what the devil says, then they're part of the dragon system. Is that correct? That's logical. So we need to know what does the devil teach. So we go to Revelation 12, 9, and we see that the devil, Satan, is the one which deceives the whole world. Well, you only deceive someone with words. John 8, verse 44 tells us, you are of your father the devil, Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and he says, the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. So we know he's a liar. He doesn't speak the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaketh a lie. He speaketh his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. So I want to know, what are his lies? And therefore, I have to go to Genesis and hear what he had to say. And we read there in Genesis 3, from verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Whereas God had said what? You shall surely die. So he's lying. He's saying you will not die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be like gods. Lie number two. Knowing good and evil. So the third lie. So the first lie is immortality. You will not die. You are immortal. The second one is, you are like God. The third one is, you are capable in your own capacity to decide what is good and what is evil. You don't need God for it. Those are the three lies of the devil. So any religious system that incorporates that is preaching what? Dragon theology. That's what they're preaching. So any religious system that preaches immortality of the soul is preaching what kind of religion? Dragon religion. Does that open the way for spiritism? Yes, because the devil can impersonate people that are dead. So all spiritualistic religions are dragon religions. And all the others might have components of the dragon's religion. But in its purest form you'll find it in spiritism. The beast component. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So he's the main representative of the dragon. So all the lies of the dragon must surely also be in the beast, right? You cannot represent the dragon if you don't tell his lies. And he had the components of a leopard. Now the leopard in Daniel represented which kingdom? Greece. So he is steeped in Greek philosophy. But he also has the components of the bear. And that was Medo-Persia. And then he has the mouth of a lion, so that which he speaks is Babylonian. That's why he has a name, Babylon. He speaks Babylonian. All right. Well, the reformers were pretty clear on who this was. They were all of one accord that this represented the papacy where its entire structure in the way the papacy is set up with the divi di different divisions, the, 
the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, the whatever they all are, and the structural components, the hierarchy, is Medo-Persian, it's Mitraism, it's bare. But the philosophy that underlies everything, the body of it, is Greek philosophy. And the ruling power has the horns and has the crowns on it is Roman power. So we must expect Roman aspects of legislation and law and we must expect Greek philosophy and we must have the structure of Mithraism in it. Now, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, Come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. So this is a woman, this is a church that is apostate towards God. She's a prostitute that sitters on many waters. So she must be universal because she sits on many nations. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So the kings of the world, political entities, must be in cahoots with her. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Her apostasy towards God has made the nations drunk. So obviously the nations have absorbed the theology of who? The dragon. This is serious stuff. And so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. The beast, according to Daniel, is a political entity, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The ten horns are, of course, Rome. And the seven heads, seven is the number of deity. She is taking the place of deity. And the woman was arrayed in purple colors and scarlet colors and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. There's only one church in the world that uses the woman with a cup as her emblem. And when you walk into the Vatican and you go to the right court, there you have the two statues, the one of the kings bowing down to her and the other one with a woman in the cup in the hand. So arrogant, she does not appear to be ashamed at all at advertising who she is. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, if she's the mother, then she must have children, right? And these children are nice children, or are they also harlots? They're also harlots. So there must be a lot of other churches that are also teaching apostasy. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. So this system has persecuted God's people throughout the ages. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw, I wondered with great admiration. Now here's one of the woodcuts from Martin Luther's first Bible. And uh, it's amazing. And he writes, There stand all the Pope's bulls and books in which he roars like a lion, that no Christian can be saved without being obedient and subject to him in all he wishes, all that he says, all that he does. All of this powerfully demonstrates that he is the true Christ of the end times or Antichrist who has opposed and exalted himself over Christ. Quoting Thessalonians, For he will not permit Christians to be saved apart from his power, even though his power is nothing, neither established nor commanded by God. Finally, it is nothing but the devil himself at work, when the Pope pushes his lies about masses and purgatories and monastic life and human works and worship, which is in fact the essence of the papacy, over and against God and condemns, kills, harasses all Christians who do not exalt and honor this abomination of his above all things. Martin Luther had a way with words, as you see. And the woodcut... You see the kings of the world bowing down to the woman riding the beast and she has the papal tiara on her head just to make sure that everybody knows what he was talking about. And Martin Luther was personally involved in the woodcuts. Now here's an interesting one. Here are two renditions of his Bible editions. 
These are the two witnesses speaking, and uh, the dragon that is about to attack them, and you will see that the first one had this triple crown on it. Not very prominent, but it had it on. And then there was a complaint by the princes, and so the next edition had that triple crown removed and replaced with a normal kingly crown. And Martin Luther was upset. So we read, once Luther was convinced that the Roman papacy was the Antichrist, he wasted no time making it known in his writings, and using the artist at his disposal, Lucas Cranach, to reinforce it visually. He had Cranach portray the beast that comes up from the abbess with a triple tier papal tiara to accompany Revelation 11 in the first edition, September 1522 of his translation. Probably the complaint of the Imperial Council or Regency, Reichsregiment, the papal tiara had to be replaced in the second edition by a simple crown in 1522. But that didn't please Martin Luther at all. And so he had the next one commissioned with the dragon even bigger and a massive triple crown on the heads that nobody would miss it. <laughs> and it says... When Luther's translation of the entire Bible was being prepared for publication in 1534, and the as yet unidentified manuscript from Cranach's workshop was preparing woodcuts, based in a large part on Cranach's previous woodcuts, the triple tier tiara was restored. And it says here, Luther wasn't just responsible for the translation, but also for much of the artwork. So, this was clearly identified by the Protestant Reformation, and we do not have to guess who the beast was. So we have to go to the false prophet. Who's he? Revelation 19, verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, who wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake, of fire burning with brimstone. So we know that it must be an earthly institution because together with the beast, the papal power, it will be destroyed when Christ destroys it with fire from heaven. But the dragon is not there. Why? Because he's not destroyed during the millennium, right? He is alive. Now who is this false prophet? So the second beast of Revelation 13 tells us what his characteristics are. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns, like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And with this fire he will deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do before the beast. So here is a lamb-like beast, a political system with two horns. And what are these two horns? Well, what were they in the case of Babylon? It was churchcraft and statecraft. So these two coming together again. The next component is that it deceives them that live on this earth with fire from heaven. Now what is fire from heaven? Fire from heaven is the false outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What happened when the disciples received the Holy Spirit? Tongues of fire came down. So which organization emanating from the second beast with its components, and when you study them through, we're not going to do that tonight, it'll take all night, we can see that it arises when the first beast receives a mortal wound, and the exact animal or creature that arises at that time, political system, is the United States of America. Does the United States of America sell a religion to the world that is based on fire from heaven? Absolutely. But it is a deceptive fire. It's a deceptive fire. Why? 
How do you know that it's a deceptive fire? Because it's not in harmony with the words of God. It's in harmony with some of the principles of the dragon. It teaches, for amongst other things, immortality. And it teaches that the law is no more. Now, institutionalized false prophetic movements, of course, are part of this system. If this is true, if Protestant America, with all its religious affiliations, represents this beast, then there will be many false prophets. So the term false prophet may apply to individuals, but also to institutions. In the days before Protestantism, there was largely only one false prophet as institution, namely Rome. But when Protestants split into factions and manifested the same spirit of persecution towards those that differed from them as Rome had done, well, then there were suddenly many false prophets. And when Jesus, in Matthew 24, 11, said, And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many, and in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Watch out for false spirits. Try the spirits. How do you try the spirits? By the word. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world, these are institutionalized false prophets, prophetic movements, preaching movements. Prophecy means also to preach. So these are churches that are preaching false doctrine, and they are the daughters of the beast of Rome. Jeremiah 51.9, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her, and let us go everyone into his own country, for her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up unto the skies. That was typical Babylon. An anti-typical Babylon, spiritual Babylon, will have the same criteria, and you have to forsake her. You have to get out of her. So Revelation 19.20, And the beast was taken, and the false prophet that wrought the miracles before him, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped its image, these both were cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So these religious systems will be destroyed. And this is a serious issue, because how many millions of people? No, let's rephrase that. Billions of people are in those systems. It is incredible. So what we have here is what I call a clash of wills. Matthew 6.10 Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Is God's will being done in earth as it is in heaven at the moment? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Mark 3.35, for whoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. It has to do the will of God. Okay. Ephesians tells us, not with eye service, not as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God. Why? Because you are forced? No, from the heart. This is what God wants. Hebrews 10, 36, And if you need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So there's a clear outline. The will of God has to be done. 1 Peter 2, 15, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 3.17, it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than evil-doing. And the world passes away and the lust of thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Romans 7.2, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek the glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. James tells us, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, that ye do well. You have to do the law of God. You have to be obedient to God. That is the will. So obviously, the other system must have something else. So what is the opposite of doing well? 
must be doing evil, right? 2 Kings 17, 13. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways. Now, Bible, please define for me what are evil ways. And keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I have commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. So you have doing well and you have doing evil. Evil is not doing the will of God, not keeping his commandments. That's the definition. It's not rocket science. Is there any particular thing why the typical Babylon issue was brought up and why the people of God went into captivity? Ezekiel tells us that they rebelled against God. Let's read that. In the day that I lifted up my hand unto them and bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had despised for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands, then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abomination of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. They didn't listen. They stuck to their idolatry. And I gave them my statutes, and I showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And I gave them my Sabbaths. We have to look at the typical to understand the anti-typical. To be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. But the house of Israel rebelled. So what, it, what was the issue? Rebelling against his law, rebelling against his statues, and desecrating his Sabbath. Can we expect the same at the end of time? Must be. They despised my judgments. My Sabbath they greatly polluted. Ezekiel 20 verse 16 says, Because they despised my judgments... And walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. So we have to look into these issues. Those are the issues that we'll find at the end of time. So I want the world out there to know what Babylon is and what the issues are. So the Lord tried with their children, so the fathers wouldn't listen. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Won't you please walk in my statues? In the statues of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes. Keep my judgments. Do them. Hallow my Sabbaths. Did he change with the children? Same issue. And there shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes. Neither kept they my judgments. They polluted my Sabbaths. Okay, is it going to happen again? Yes. Yes, the consequences are going to be the same. Now here's a question that I have. How important is it that the law of God should be maintained? How important is law? And how would God feel about his law? Being God and sovereign of the universe, do you think he has a system of government that is important to him, his law? Didn't we just read it? My commandments, my statutes, my law. So I thought it interesting that this man, Tegra Gaudi, do you know him? Have you ever heard of him, Tegra Gaudi? Yes, yes. He's a congressman. Well, he's, he's gone back into, into his legal uh, work right now. But this man, he impresses me. If he were the president of the United States, I would really look and see, whoo, they've chosen someone who really knows his stuff. This man is good. So his name is Harold Watson, Tay Grady, they call him. 
and is an American attorney, politician, former federal prosecutor, served in the U.S. Representative for South Carolina, 14th Congress District, etc. And uh, he was a congressman. So he was in the House Oversight Committee. I mean, he's a very, very prominent man. He served in the time of Hillary Clinton, and he was uh, there in the opposition banks of Obama, and he was in the beginning even with the present president, Donald Trump. Now, I want to show you how he feels about law. And I thought it was such a good speech that I wanted to play it to you. Listen to his speech on the law. The House. The law is the reason we exist. We do not exist to uh, pass ideas or to pass suggestions. Uh, we make law with the corresponding expectation that that law will be enforced, respected, and executed. And we do so because the law is the thread that holds the tapestry of this country together. It is the most unifying, equalizing force that we have. It makes the rich respect the poor. It allows the powerless to challenge the powerful. And attempts to undermine the law, Mr. Speaker, regardless of motivation, are detrimental to the social order. In 2014, President Obama declared unilaterally that almost 5 million unlawful immigrants would receive deferred action under some torture definition of prosecutorial discretion. I can't help but note the word discretion means sometimes you say yes and sometimes you say no, but of course the administration has never said no. The court found not a single time has the administration said no, so that's not prosecutorial discretion, Mr. Speaker. That's lawlessness. And you may like what the president did. I take it from some of the speakers that they do. And you may actually wish what the president did was, was actually law. I can't. You may wish, Mr. Speaker, you may wish that when Democrats controlled the House to send it in the White House for two years, that they had lifted a finger to do a single solitary thing about what they're talking about this morning. You may wish that. You may wish that all these grandiose policies that we are talking about this morning on the other side that they cared enough about to actually make law when they had a chance, but they did not. And they know now that one person doesn't make the law in a republic. Uh, you may want to live in a country where one person makes the law, but that would not be this country. You would have to look for another one. And the president knows this because more than 20 times, Mr. Speaker, he said he could not do the very thing that he eventually did. His power didn't change. The law didn't change. The politics is all that changed. And we should have seen this coming, Mr. Speaker. He warned us on this very floor. He warned us that he didn't need the people's house. He said he'd do it with or without Congress. And many of you cheered when he said that. Many of you cheered because you benefit from the non-enforcement of the law today. But tomorrow will be different. Tomorrow is coming, and tomorrow will be different. Tomorrow you will cry out for the enforcement of the law. Tomorrow you will want others to follow the law. We are here, Mr. Speaker, because this administration violated one law in its haste to allow others to violate yet another law. The administration lost, and then they appealed. So here we are before the Supreme Court for ten Mr. Speaker, Congress has let the executive branch engage in constitutional adverse possession. Today it's immigration. Tomorrow it will be some other law. And one day, I say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, one day your party may not control the gears of enforcement. One day a Republican president might decide that he or she doesn't like a law and is going to ignore it and fail to enforce it. For more than two centuries, Mr. Speaker, the law has been more important than any political issue. It's been more important than any election. It's been more important, frankly, than any one of us. It binds us together and it embodies the virtues that we cherish, like fairness and equality and justice and mercy. And we symbolize our devotion to the law with this blindfolded woman holding a set of scales and a sword. And that blindfold keeps her focus on the law. But I want you to understand this, Mr. Speaker. Once that blindfold slips off, it's gone forever. You can want to put it back on, but it is gone together because once you weaken the law, 
good luck putting it back together. So once you decide that some laws are worth enforcing and some are not, once you decide that some laws are worth following and others are not, You've weakened this thing we call the law, and you have weakened it forever. Let me just tell you this. I'll say this, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't take any courage to follow a law you like. That doesn't take any courage. Following a law you like? What takes courage, which makes us different, is we follow laws even that we don't like. And then we strive to change them. Legally. That is the power and the fragility of the law. But once it is abandoned, it is weakened in the eyes of expect to follow it. I'll say this, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, in the oath of citizenship that we require new citizens to take, could I have 45 more seconds? Two minutes. Gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the oath of citizenship that we require new citizens to take, and I'm sure the Speaker already knows this, and perhaps some of my Colleagues on the other side may know this as well. But in that oath, it references the law five separate times. Five separate references to this thing we call the law in the very oath that we want new citizens to take. Five times in a single paragraph. Mr. Speaker, good luck explaining why new citizens should follow the law when those in power do not have to. Good luck explaining the difference between anarchy and the wholesale failure to enforce a law simply because you do not like it. Good luck stopping the next president from ignoring a law that he or she does not like. If the president can pick and choose which laws he likes, then so can the rest of us. And you have undermined the very thing that binds us together. So be careful what you do today. Tomorrow is coming. With that, I would yield back. Gentlemen, you was that excellent or was it excellent? I think that was excellent. Now, if he feels about an earthly law like that, that is so flawed, how do you think God feels about his law? <laughs> Good luck if you think that you can break God's law. Good luck. She's become a house of demons. So the truth rejected by the state churches in Europe caused the steady decline into formalism and religious indifference. They had a reputation of being alive, but they were dead. From Protestant fervor, they would return to Egypt and formalism, or total secularism and atheism would take the place of the truth so dearly purchased. Second Peter 2.21 says it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So the old controversies have been laid aside. The Pope is no longer Antichrist. Everything has been set aside. Now they believe some future Jew who has nothing to do with the, with the, with the church will be the Antichrist and the church will be raptured. So the morality of God is outdated and social justice and the common good are the new phrases to take their place. And standing behind these new ideologies is a resurrected papacy undermining God's word, God's law, and God's authority. And Protestantism looks upon the system with favor and enthrones it. It sets aside the justifying power of Christ for lawlessness and embraces the moral alternative of the man of sin. That's me writing. So if somebody wants to accuse me, that's me. But let's read it from a better pen than mine. At the same time, anarchy is sweeping away all law, not only divine but human. The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combination for the enriching of the few 
at the expense of the many, the combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claim, the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution, all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. When you switch on that news, do you see this? Is this, is, is this what is happening worldwide? Surely this pen is inspired when it wrote that. Book Education, page 228. Well, we can see it in the world. There's a far-right MP beaten half to death in assassination attempt in Germany. We have the Yellow Vest movement. We can look at all of these. Every single country is sitting on a powder keg that is about to explode and men's hearts failing them for fear. According to the German intelligence report, the far-right violence increased by 71% from 2017 to 2018. So, when today the representatives of our democracy, above all the volunteers, when major mayors and local politicians are insulted, threatened and assaulted, that is an alarm sign for our democracy. All the governments in the world are sitting on an anarchy powder keg. It's just a reality. Another quote. Satan has a large confederacy, his church. Christ calls them the synagogue of Satan because the members are the children of sin. Members of Satan's church have been constantly working to cast off the divine law and confuse the distinction between good and evil. Satan is working with great power in and through the children of disobedience to exalt treason and apostasy as truth and loyalty. And at this time, the power of his satanic inspiration is moving the living agencies to carry out the great rebellion against God that commenced in heaven. At this time, the church is to put on her beautiful garments, Christ our righteousness. There is a clear, decided distinction to be restored and exemplified to the world in holding aloft the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The beauty of holiness is to appear in its native luster in contrast with the deformity and darkness of the disloyal, those who have revolted from the law of God. That's the issue. That is the issue. Charisma News, Pope Francis, leading imam, signed covenant pushing us towards a one world religion. And that's Charisma News, telling us we're heading towards this one world religion. Hand in hand, in a symbol of interfaith brotherhood, they signed the joint documents. The Babylonian system is coming together. Does Islam teach immortality of the soul? Yes or no? Yes, it teaches is immortality of the soul. Does Islam teach Mariology? Absolutely. The Marian shrines are everywhere. You go to the Middle East, you have these Marian shrines, and the Muslim people are hanging up their letters to Mary. It is nothing other than the doctrine which was espoused in Eden. And I'm fascinated how the circumstances are pushing churches and religious groups together. Macron says Notre Dame should be rebuilt with diversity and the architect suggests an Islamic minaret. Maybe we should join the two religions together. Maybe we should have a kind of a Chrislam. France flagged more than 78,000 people as jihadist security threats in 2017. And we don't want that anymore. We want religions to come together. We want this violence to end. We want to push them together into one unity. Some people say there were all kinds of strange figures and uh, haunting figures and uh, Knights Templars that were visible, but it was probably just uh, firemen walking around there. So all kinds of theories going around. France, Macron says Notre Dame should be rebuilt consistent with modern, diverse France. Architects suggest steel spire and minaret. This is one source after the other. 
Jesuit educated Macron, favorite to beat Le Pen, as Catholic bishops warmed to him as next president. These people are all Jesuit trained. No wonder they have such strong ties. The kings of the world will pay homage unto the beast. The Pope and Emmanuel Macron hug it out in a photo of the remarkably long meeting. What are these people discussing? And then the al Aska Mosque catches fire at the same time that the Notre Dame Cathedral is burning. And people are saying, we need to get together. This chaos has to stop. And then what happens? The world mourned when Notre Dame burned, but some saw it as an opportunity to make France Catholic again. Let's get religion back in. Let's get religion to organize society. Society is in chaos. And we have all of these mass shootings. You cannot even keep up. You put one up, it's outdated the next day, isn't it? Because there's another bigger shooting somewhere along the line. People are so tired of terrorism and all of these things. Catholic Herald, a mosque in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates capital, has been renamed Mary Mother of Jesus Mosque. What's happening? Is Babylon coming together? And there it is, and it says above there, Mary, mother of Jesus' mosque. Do they have the same doctrines? They have the same doctrines. And people say, no, Allah is the same God that we serve. And people within our own ranks say things like this. So I took the Quran and I read it from cover to cover. From back to front like it should be read. And I read it like I would read my Bible, carefully underlining every word. And I find the immortality of the soul. And I find angels dragging people across burning coals and throwing them into the fires of hell. And Allah standing by while their skins burn off. And they drink drinks of scalding brass to burn the insides of them out. And the next day they get a new skin and a new inside so they can feel the same burning and pain again. The same doctrine that Rome peddled about God is being peddled by Islam. And I read these doctrines and Mariology, the highest woman in heaven. Not even Fatima is as high as he is. And the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception right there in the Quran. And then they say the Quran has the health message just because pork is forbidden? No. It may eat the camel. It may be, eat the hare. They may eat anything that comes out of the waters. And those prohibitions for all those foods was just because of the disobedience of the Jews. And so we carry on and on and on, every doctrine contrary to that which is in the Bible. And the Sabbath is mentioned in the Quran. But it says there that the Sabbath was kept by the Jews because of their disobedience, while it sells us to keep the Friday, which they don't even keep except over lunchtime. Every single doctrine that the Bible has on these issues, and Jesus, he's always just the son of Mary. Mary is the one. It's Mary, mother of Jesus' mosque. Not Jesus' mosque. Doesn't matter as long as Jesus is on the sideline. It's exactly the same system. And I know we'll probably be crucified for saying this again. But it is a fact. Read your Quran and you will know. But it also speaks about the coming of Jesus. Yes. Yes. Islam can't await the coming of Jesus because Jesus will destroy everyone who worshipped him as God. That means every Christian will be destroyed. Do we understand these differences? And how can the papacy join up with that system if it isn't of one accord with it? How can they sign a document if it isn't of one accord? Well, let's continue. The controversy, even though these mega-religions are coming all together into one system, will be fought out within Christendom. 
the controversy centers in Christendom. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive action. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What's it say there? Every nation will be involved. Of this time, John the Revelator declares, These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy confederacy of Satan's forces. Are we seeing it develop, yes or no? And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty. Freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience as was manifested by the papacy. When in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. In the great conflict between faith and unbelief, the whole Christian world will be involved. This is where we're heading. This is where we're heading. The gospel is now opposed on every side. Never was the confederacy of evil stronger than at the present time. Spirits of evil are combining with human agencies to war against the commandments of God. Tradition, falsehoods are exalted above scripture. Smooth sermons so often preached make no lasting impression. Men are not cut to the heart because of the plain sharp truth of the word of God are not spoken to them. Many of those who profess to believe the truth would say, if they express their real sentiments, what need is there of speaking so plainly? They might as well ask, why need John the Baptist have said to the Pharisees, O generation of vipers? Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why need he have provoked the anger of Herodias by telling Herod that it was unlawful for him to live with his brother's wife? He lost his life for speaking so plainly. Why could he not have moved along without incurring the anger of Herodias? We're not supposed to be silent in a time like this. It's God's honor that is at stake. And here's a Jewish author. I find this fascinating. A Jewish author who says that America needs its Christian values. So the Jewish religion... The Islamic religion, all of them coming together. So, he argues in his new book, Dark Agenda, that the war to destroy Christian America, that secularist and leftist want to turn the nation into a godless heathen society where religion has absolutely no role. He says the war on Christianity is real and it's right on our doorstep. This is a Jew defending Christian morals and laws. In an inclusive interview, he says that the efforts by conservatives of all faiths are required to save them. Now it's very bad in the U.S., this war against Christianity is a war of the left, which is the Democratic Party, because Christian values are incompatible with the social justice delusion of the left. Everything about Christianity... But you argue that it's not what our father, founding fathers intended? No, he says. Our found, founding fathers wanted this to be a state based on religion. So we're going back to church and state. Wall of separation of church and state is becoming a bumper sticker slogan for leftists and secularists who want to silence religious people, marginalize their beliefs. This wall has to go. And how does President Donald Trump fit into this fabric? He's terrific for America. He's a great patriot. And I think that's what inspired the evangelicals to support him. What about the Democrats? They're, they're wicked. They're doing this, that, and the other. You say the catalyst for writing the book was the intolerance of the left. Can you explain? Before I began writing the book and was becoming acquainted with all the issues, I thought the persecution of Christians was a somewhat parochial issue. I sympathize. I have sympathy for this community because the left is being so intolerant. It's interesting. In other words, this is like a Hegelian dialectic driving people towards a particular direction. 
that even the Democrats are beginning to say, whoa, we better introduce God again or we'll never get into power again. Isn't this fascinating? Where is this all going? I'm not going to play this video because it's very long, but this is Netanyahu talking to John Hagee at his uh, Christians United for Israel. And he makes a beautiful speech, I must say. It's brilliant. I wish I could play it to you, but it's very long. We haven't got time for it, but you can look it up on the web. Basically, what he says is we are all drinking from the same wellspring. And that is the Word of God. This is our heritage. This is the Jewish heritage. This is the Christian heritage. We are drinking from the same wellspring. And he's saying, you know what? There's religious persecution in all the countries, but not in Israel. In Israel, the Christian may worship next to the Jew and next to the Muslim. They have freedom of religion. They may do as they please. Nobody bothers them. This is the model we are striving for. But he doesn't say that you're not allowed to evangelize in Israel. In other words, as long as you keep to your little thing and don't open your mouth and don't preach what you believe in a public forum, you can do what you want, but you're not allowed to do the other. You cannot go into all the world and preach the gospel. You can't do that. So this model might sound wonderful. We're all together in the same pot, but we'll see where it's going to lead. So Pastor John Hagee said... That, listen, the dates, 14 July 1990, he said, secularizing of America will lead to heartache and chaos. We cannot afford it. We need to go back to a church-state solution. Figures in government or media are trying to secularize American culture and will lead the country away from its founding Judeo-Christian principles. We need to go back to those. Passover glory, Chuck Pierce, 2018. What do they want to celebrate? They want to celebrate unity. Billy Graham recently passed away and it has been prophesied that once he does, his mantle for mass harvest would be released to many. Billy Graham's mantle is going to come down. Fascinating. I took his picture on the wall shaking hands with J. Edgar Hoover with his Shriner hat and Masonic gear and he's from in the Masonic temple. I don't want his mantle. Also, we are on the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence with the U.S. Embassy about to relocate to Jerusalem and all the signs are pointing to an awakening. We are on the verge of the third great awakening. Now, the last great awakening led to the Advent movement. Now we're on the way to the third great awakening, where Billy Graham's mantle will come down. I want to know what that is going to mean. This is big. You'll see how big it is. I have never in my lifetime seen a paradigm shift this big as what it is about to occur in America what you do this year to align with God will determine the course of your life for many years, as this is a kairos year unlike any other. What you do this year and how you position yourself has great eternal consequences in your destiny. Now is the time, a time for divine appointment with a greater glory unlike any other time in history. Are they doing something to the minds of men? The old fading glory is passing away and a fresh upgraded greater glory is about to be released at Passover. You can't live off the old. You need the new greater glory for what is coming this year. Here's another source. The double portion of Billy Graham's mantle is coming soon. Stephen Powell's vision of the greatest awakening the U.S. has ever seen. We are on the verge of final events. Charisma News, why thousands of people will contend for Billy Graham's mantle. This is fascinating. This is 2019. This is not old stuff. 
Let's get sober. There is but one church in the world who are at present time standing in the breach and making up the hedge, building up the old waste places. And for any man to call the attention of the world and other churches to this church denouncing her as Babylon is to do the work in harmony with him who is the accuser of the brethren. The whole world is filled with hatred of those who proclaim the binding claims of the law of God. And the church who are loyal to Jehovah must engage in no ordinary conflict. Those who have any realization of what this warfare means will not turn their weapons against the church militant, but with all their power will wrestle with the people of God against the confederacy of evil. That's our job. Those who start up to proclaim a message on their own individual responsibility who while claiming to be taught and led of God still make it their special work to tear down that which God has been building since all these years, are not doing the will of God, but be it known that these men are on the side of the great deceiver. Believe them not. Is there still such a voice? Is there such a church? Well, this book was handed out or given out by the General Conference in 1952. Pacific Press Publishing Association. Principles of Life from the Word of God. In actual fact, it was more or less like a fundamental belief document. And this is what the church believed in 1952. And I stand by every word. I'm not going to read you what it says, but it had pictures in it which tell what they believed, and I'll show you some of the pictures. God's eternal Ten Commandments have been tampered with by the fires of heaven. My covenant will I not break nor alter the things which have gone out of my mouth. An enemy has done this. Here's another one in that book. The forces of error have endeavored to hold sway by the use of dungeon and the sword and the stake and the prison. Truth needs no such support. Human effort, clothes, clothiers. The only acceptable garment at that marriage supper is the faith and the righteousness of Christ. Faith in the righteousness of Christ. Law of types and ceremonies has been nailed to the cross. Catholics say the tiara of the Pope of Rome is the symbol of his power and authority. They weren't afraid to say who was who. They weren't afraid. The lamb-like qualities of the two-horned beast will disappear in hate and bloodshed. Religious and civil liberty. Tragic transformation into a terrible beast. Speaking like a dragon. Churches that have left the word of God and taken man's tradition becomes corrupt. I wish my church would still preach like this. Full of doleful creatures. Read Revelation 18.2. Idolatry of the mass. Papal infallibility. Communion of the dead. Confession to a man. Image worship. Immaculate conception of Mary. Tradition above the Bible. Man is by nature immortal. The teaching of natural immortality does away with Christ's redemption for lost man. I am so proud of this book. God calls upon the church to give his message to the world that faces the judgment. Loud voice. Three angels' messages. Stop. Are we faithful to our God-given trust? Third angel's message. The world is on the brink of a catastrophe. Satanic effort to break the chain. The Bible and prophecy. Every link will hold. God's line of prophecy marks the way through the kingdom without error. And it tells us about the prophetic charts. The world must pause and decide at this parting point of ways. Either Sunday or Sabbath. And they make no uncertain pictures here. Who's this pointing the way of the Sunday? And what is this one holding, pointing the other way? The Bible. And I like this one too. Sunday, in honor of Christ's resurrection, this man looks really angry. When the seventh day Sabbath, and they align it with Cain and Abel. This was 1952. No man can go in two directions, evil desires, full obedience. Where are these teachings? This is an official document from the General Conference, 1952. 
By living faith will the barriers of doubt and unbelief be broken down in this age. Error, modern Jericho, remnant of Israel, unbelief. Popery is just what prophecy declared that she should be. The apostasy of the latter times. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. We are not bound to keep faith and promises to heretics, she declares. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as part of the Christian church? The church that holds to the word of God is irreconcilably separated from Rome. Protestants were once thus apart from this great church of apostasy, but they have approached more nearly to her and are still on the path of reconciliation to the church of Rome. Rome never changes. Her principles have not altered in the least. And don't quote these modern documents with their fancy Jesuitical writing which dupe the children of God to sign documents which give papal doctrines instead of biblical doctrines under the pretense of a Bible passage. Rome never changes. She has not lessened the breach between herself and Protestants. They have done all the advancing. But what does this argue for the Protestantism of today? It is the rejection of Bible truth which makes men's approach to infidelity. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. If you go into the ecumenical councils, you are a backslidden church. And this is the religion which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor and which will eventually be united with Protestantism. This union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hands of Catholicism. Is this happening? Famed Crystal Cathedral reopens as Roman Catholic Church after $72 million renovation. They bought it for $62 million. They renovated it. And they put in an altar. And they put in a relic in the altar because you cannot say a mass without a portion of a dead body in it. And who did they put in there? A piece of John Paul II. Apostasy of the latter days, idolatry of the highest order, and Protestantism thinks this is just fine. Do you know who Todd White is? The televangelist. Do you know who Lou Engels is? These people are organizing huge campaigns, stadiums filled with thousands and thousands of people. Angus Buchan in Africa, in my country, the man who preaches with a hat on his head. Millions of people, the greatest crusades the world has ever seen. Do you want to see what they are doing? Let's have a look. Okay, here's, here's the deal. I believe that the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are going to come together right now. So Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for a mighty baptism on the Catholic Church, God. Holy Spirit, more. Fire. Jesus' name. Fire of heaven. In the name of Jesus. We're a delegation, a Catholic delegation, and I come from e Italy. Vi porto il saluto da parte di 150 milioni di cattolici carismatici. And I bring you a salute from 150 million charismatic Catholics. We want to, Lou, kiss your feet as Catholics and just honor you with this gesture right now. Raise up Catholics all over the world. 
One billion souls of Catholics to come into the kingdom of God. The hour is coming. The chains are broken. The loosing of the Lord upon every single Catholic in the world that they would see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A revival will spring forth in the Catholic Church like never before. This is holy lo spirito di divisione because you're breaking the spirit of division tu prepari un grande risveglio in you're preparing a great revival all'inizio Many across the body of Christ have had a sense in your heart that a massive spiritual awakening is coming to America. And I realized that in that moment that we were at the beginning of a movement. Now is the time for spiritual awakening and that now is the time for a massive missions wave to the nations of the earth. In 2011, a major revelatory shift took place. Into my living room walked these YWAM wild men. And they begin to prophesy, there's coming a shift to the call. And it will not just be fasting and prayer, but the proclamation of the gospel. Signs and wonders and stadiums will be filled. And Billy Graham's mantle's coming on the nation. And then they said, the call is going to lead to the sin. And it struck me, maybe the call is a forerunner for a new Jesus movement coming. It put me in shock and I knew it had a time period to look to the place and time when Billy Graham would die. At that moment, a massive shift's coming and it will not just be John the Baptist, it will be Jesus the Evangelist is going to fill stadiums in America. From that moment on, a dream exploded in my spirit. That if I saw stadiums filled with young people fasting and praying, why wouldn't I believe that I would see stadiums filled with massive evangelism, signs and wonders and miracles and hundreds of thousands of people being saved in America? If I saw the first fulfillment, why couldn't I believe for the second fulfillment? And so what we see is that there are these moments in history where the power of God is present to do something extraordinary. There's an opportunity, there is an open door. And what happens is, is that if that generation will step through that open door by faith and take action, they can literally see history change. We believe this day something will transfer and bring us into, I believe, worldwide transition into the greatest Jesus movement we have ever seen. to pray one prayer only one prayer i'm going to pray that god will increase your faith tonight to believe for your miracle i want to say to pastors here tonight you need to be in the front first sir not behind your flock in front of your flock in israel we lead the sheep we don't chase the sheep there are sick people here tonight the doctor said there's no more we can do for you but god but God, but God, the biggest revival the world's ever seen is going to start. The biggest revival the world has ever seen. Six weeks. Six weeks.
that has ever seen a prayer meeting like this. We are going to pray for our president, His Excellency, Sir Ramaphosa. But I have a word for you, sir. And I know you, we have spent an afternoon together. I'm so sorry you couldn't make it today. I would have loved to have prayed for you on this platform in front of all these people. No, Tanja, come on, mate. We are going to implement the Ten Commandments in this country. And we shall not steal. And we shall not murder. And we shall not tell lies. And we shall not have any other God. Save the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What are they going to implement? The Ten Commandments. I have a word for you, Mr. President. Are we there? This is not small. This is what this church has been preaching. Has the papacy changed? This comes from 2018. It's Catholic Answers. The authority of the Pope. They note, as Ignatius of Antioch does, that Rome holds the presidency amongst the other churches, and that, as Irenaeus explains, because of its superior origins, all churches must agree with Rome. I'm not quoting from the Middle Ages. I'm quoting from Catholic Answers 2018. Is there any Protestant denomination that has an excuse? No. No, they don't. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let it be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Only when it is too late to escape the snare, she is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends. When the time shall come for her to strike, all that she desires is vantage ground. And this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purposes of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Take heed unto thyself, 1 Timothy 4, 16, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. 2 Peter 1, 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. This is part one. Part two tells us how. May God wake up his people. May they realize what is going on. Just because she knows how to use terminology to de dupe and deceive people, doesn't mean that she is not teaching the doctrines of devils. May God help us to understand these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are standing on the brink of eternity. Please wake your people up. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share and we would like to hear from you.